first strip that we're going to look at, we find Charlie Brown and Linus discussing what it means to be a fanatic. And Linus says, you know, when I get big, I'm going to be a real fanatic. And Charlie Brown asks, well, what are you going to be fanatical about, Linus? Linus pauses to think about that for a moment, and then he says, well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. And then in the final frame, he figures it out. I'll be sort of a wishy-washy fanatic. Kind of a contradiction in terms there. What do we really believe? And how do we and others know that's what we believe? In a follow-up to that strip, Linus begins to go down the dark path here of fanaticism. He and Charlie Brown are together again. Charlie says, it's a beautiful day like today, isn't it? In the next frame, Linus responds, well, what about yesterday? And how about the day before? And then Linus gets louder. What was wrong with the day before? Totally taking Charlie Brown off guard. And then in the final frame, as Linus walks away, he says, a good fanatic is always ready for an argument. Here in Revelation chapter 2, John is writing down for us what Christ has to say to the churches. And he's concerned about what we really value. What's really important to us? What is our reason to exist? What do we really believe and how do we respond when our beliefs are challenged? Will they, like Linus, just be a lot of hot air or will they stand firm in their faith? We pick up today in verse 12. It says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? We saw last week that we don't know a whole lot about the church at Smyrna. The same way is true about the church at Pergamum from Scripture. We don't have references to them. But we do find, again, a lot about them in history and in church history. Pergamum means citadel. And it represents that there, there was this plateau a thousand feet up, which looked down over the city itself of Pergamum that lied in the valley beneath. And it made a perfect place to build a fort where you could see miles around and have a place of defense. We find that unlike Ephesus and Smyrna, that it was 20 miles inland. And so it was not a major trade route necessarily, uh, like they were with the port city and all these roads going out from it but it was more of a cultural center. There were a lot of things there that showed the dynamics of, of many cities. One of the things it had was the second largest library in the world, second only to Alexandria in ancient history. And the name Pergamon itself comes from the word for parchment. And so Pergamon was known for parchment, so there was no better place to have a library than where you had the major source of the writing material for that day. And so during the rule of the Greeks, Mark Anthony took and gave this library as a gift to Cleopatra. So as you can imagine, it was a very elaborate library, like some of the major city libraries we know of today. When Roman rule began to expand and it was overtaking the Greek Empire, um, there were other things going down, the Gauls came down, and so the city leaders of Pergamon decided that they would take sides with Rome against Greece and against the Gauls coming down to invade, and so they helped to drive them out. And as a reward, Rome made Pergamum the capital city of the province and began to invest a lot of money in the plateau here, in the citadel, as well as in troops, and then all sorts of other cultural buildings in the city. 
Pergamon was also a major religious center. They had the first temple to Zeus, and Zeus was considered to be the most powerful of the Greek gods, the god of sky, lightning, thunder, weather, and of course the representation there of the lightning bolt and the thunder. It was also home to Athena, the goddess of war, and they celebrated her, of course, and the victory they had over the Gauls and other great wars. It was also home to the temple of Dionysius, the god of drunkenness. And so that tells us a lot more about what that city was like. And then finally, on the outskirts of the city was the temple to Asclepius, who was the god of medicine. And the symbol was the snake. So still today, we have that symbol with the symbol for medicine. And so people would flock to Pergamon for the latest remedies from their illnesses and their complaints. In the second half of verse 12, we find the from part. It says, these are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. As we saw, this description comes from chapter 1, when we had a more extended description of Christ. And he says, I am the one with the two-edged sword, this long, sharp, powerful sword of judgment, as opposed to that Roman short sword, which was more like a big dagger. That indeed, Christ carries the all-powerful judgment of God, bigger than any empire ever has. Paul talks about the sword as the word of God in Ephesians 6, that it cuts to the core. It is able to penetrate our hearts, our motives, to show what indeed we do value most. The next part of the letter, as we've seen in our other two letters, is Christ's evaluation of their church. And he begins that in verse 13. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. He says, I know where you live. Now, when we say that, I know where you live, that's more of a threat. If you do this, I know where I can find you. But this statement here is very different. The statement here, rather, is a word of encouragement and actually a compliment. He says, I know what you're putting up with. I know the kind of city where you are living. As followers of Christ, you live in the home of Satan. You live where he lives. Now, some scholars think he's referring especially to Zeus, who was considered the greatest of the Greek gods, the god of great power, and he represents, of course, everything having to do with the Roman Empire and Greek Empire, with the pagan gods and all their power and authority. Or it could have been a representation as well of the god of healing, represented by the snake, the serpent, as Satan represented himself in the garden. Either way, we find these powerful figures sitting on their thrones there in the city of Pergamum. He says, I know what you're going through with all of this wickedness and this evil worship going on around you. We find that the healing ceremonies of the God of healing often involved going into the temple, lying on the floor, and allowing snakes to crawl over you so you could absorb their healing powers. It really makes you want to go to the doctor, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's the kinds of things that were involved there, as well as all of the drinking and gross immorality that was involved there in Pergamum. But notice he says, Yet, yet you, despite where you live, have remained true to Christ's name. This church was faithful to Christ. They didn't trust in the government. They didn't trust in medicine. They didn't trust in the parting of this world. They kept their faith. 
they did not renounce their faith. They continued to trust in Christ and they refused to take part in these rituals that everyone around them was taking in. They refused to bow down to the emperor in worship as we've talked about in our other studies. They refused to take part in all of these immoral practices that were involved even in the healing services. And as a result, they were being persecuted for their faith. He refers then to Antipas. We don't know a lot about him, except he calls him a faithful witness. We've seen that word before, that phrase, faithful witness. Back in chapter 1, it is used to describe Christ himself. In other words, he says, here is a true faithful follower who is acting like I would act. He's an example for us to follow in his faithfulness. He remained true to his call. He was not distracted by all the idols and the immorality of his day, but he was a witness, a martyr. He indeed was willing to give his life while he was unwilling to give himself to immorality. And so as a whole, it sounds like the church is doing pretty well. They're staying faithful nevertheless. Verse 14 begins with the second half of the evaluations. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. In the second part, we find that Christ confronts them about their compromise. That this is one of the three churches that had a mixed review, if you will, about their church. Basically, they were faithful, but there were some among them that were compromising. Some of them were beginning to stray away from the truth. They were putting their trust in the teaching of Balaam. Now, many of you are familiar with the account of Balaam in Numbers 22 to 24. We find that he was the one who was asked by King Balak to come. King Balak of the Midianites wanted him to come and curse Israel so they could defeat them in battle. And Balaam is on the way to meet Balak. And the angel of the Lord, with his sword in hand, is standing in the middle of the road, and Balaam is totally oblivious, but not his donkey. His donkey starts to veer off the road, banging into things, hitting ba Balaam's foot, and, and Balaam's getting more and more upset. He's yelling and screaming and beating on his donkey. Finally, his donkey just lays down in the middle of the road in front of the angel of the Lord with the sword in his hand. And as Balaam's beating him and yelling at him, his donkey says, why do you keep doing that? Finally, Balaam comes to his senses and he sees this, the Lord with his sword in front of him. And he says, Balaam, you can go talk with Balak, but whatever you say, you have to get from me. And so they make these arrangements, and Balaam goes, and he, he looks over the armies of Israel, and he tries to bring a curse on them, and it can't happen. Repeatedly, he tries this over and over again. Every time he tries to bring a curse on the people of Israel, he speaks out words of blessing. Finally, he gives up, Balak gives up, they part ways and go home. But the story's not over yet. As we move into chapter 25... It begins this way. It says, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual, sexual immorality with Moabite women, Balak's people, who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So these Israelite men got immorally involved with the Moabite women who introduced them to idol worship. Now that didn't just happen. It wasn't just something random that came up. Someone had planted the seed thoughts into the mind of the Moabites to do this. And we find that as we move on a few chapters later when 
finally, God says, enough of the Moabites, sends the Israelites to do away with them. And the Israelites come back with all of the plunder and with their captives. And they report that all of these soldiers of the Moabites are dead and Balaam is dead too. Moses says this in chapter 31, verse 15. Have you allowed all the women to live? They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord. So when Balaam was unable to curse Israel, he said, Balak, here's what you want to do. This isn't working. This is a plan that will work. You go, you have your women entice the men of Israel, lead them astray, take them to a party and celebrate with the meat offered to idols, and they will fall before you. Why did Balaam do it? Peter tells us in his second letter when he's talking about false teachers in the New Testament. He says, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. Balaam did it for the money. He led the people astray. So back here in Revelation chapter 2, Christ is saying the same thing's happening all over here again in Pergamum. What you have is people falling for immorality and idolatry. One leads to the other, either way. And rather than trusting Christ, some of them were putting their, their trust in the false gods of this world, be it in the government, be it in medicine, be it in drunkenness, whatever the case is. They're falling away. They're being led astray. Likewise, he says, in the same way, some members were holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And we talked about them two weeks ago. They were this libertine group who confused Christian liberty with self-indulgence. They said, we are free in Christ, and that means we can do whatever we want to do. We're saved, everything's settled, we're good. What we happen to do in the body doesn't matter. The idea was, since the grace of God now rules in our lives, the law of God no longer applies. We can just throw out everything in the Old Testament, Ten Commandments, all that stuff, who cares? We live under grace. Paul spoke out against this perspective in Romans, Romans chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, God forbid. No way, Jose. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And then as he wraps up in verse 15 at the end of that section, he says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? No way, by no means. What we do with our bodies matters. The life choices that we make in this life day to day do matter. We need to stand guard. We need to be careful because sin still is knocking at the door of our lives day in and day out. The point is, whether it is Balaam or the cult of the Nicolaitans, the end result is the same. Idolatry and immorality. Idolatry and immorality. Over and over again, it's the same pattern. Over and over again, they go together. And so we come to the warning section of the letter. Repent. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Judgment day is coming, he said. You need to repent, and we've seen that word before. Change the way that you are thinking and therefore the way you act. Stop thinking that how you live doesn't matter. It does. Stop blending in with all the unbelievers around you. Don't put your trust in the government for everything you need. Don't think that medicine is the hope of all things. Don't think that you can turn to drinking or some sort of way to numb the pain in your life. These are all replacements for trusting in God. He says if you don't repent, if you don't turn, judgment will begin. The Lord will come with his sword. 
just like he came and he held it before Balaam and said, stop. Just like he came to the Israelites and judged those that gave into the sin that took place there in Numbers 25. Just like he brought judgment on the Moabites because they kept getting in the way of God's people. Notice here that he calls all of them to repent. The call to repentance is for the whole church. That this kind of atmosphere and culture seeps in. And so the church as a whole needs to, to repent because the culture is seeping in. But the threat of judgment, notice he says, I will bring my judgment on them, on those that have fallen into idolatry and immorality. At this point, he's not saying, I'm going to take your lampstand away. I'm not going to shut your church down. But this is a warning. He says, I am going to judge those that are involved in this. And the church as a whole needs to take this seriously. Finally, we come to the, the prompting and the promise that he gives in his letters. Verse 17. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Again, we have that call to hear. Be attentive to the work and speaking of the Holy Spirit in your life as he speaks. As he speaks, he is addressing the one who is victorious. And we've seen the last couple weeks, that is one who loves, trusts, and obeys Christ. This is the promise, the incentive he gives. He says, you need to listen because there is a twofold promise here. First of all, hidden manna. You need to spend a fair amount of time here thinking about this hidden manna. Manna, of course, we know was supplied by God for his people while they were wandering in the wilderness waiting. He promises them this spiritual bread. It is something he only provided for his people. It wasn't something that just came down for everybody, but it was specifically for his people as they followed him. And in John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, very well known, one of the best known of all of Christ's miracles, there's some interesting comments that are made about manna and bread. In verse 14, it says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed feeding the 5,000, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. As people observed what Jesus did with the feeding of the 5,000, they identified him as the giver of manna and therefore the Messiah. Now, at this point, Jesus had not said anything like, I am the bread of life or anything like that. He had not said, said, I am the manna. But by doing what he did, automatically all these bells start to go up in their minds. This is the Messiah. Why did they think that? Just based on this one miracle. Well, there's a few reasons. We find that in Exodus 16, that Aaron the high priest uh, takes and he puts things in the ark and eventually they, uh, after the wilderness wandering, they take and they put some of the manna into the ark with other special items. Years later, Jerusalem falls. The temple is destroyed. Most of the people are taken away into exile in the Babylonian empire, but there's a few people, a remnant that stay behind with Jeremiah. Jewish tradition, in many writers, said that Jeremiah, when he went to Egypt, when he was taken to Egypt after the fall of Israel, the fall of Jerusalem, took with him the Ark of the Covenant. 
And in the Ark of the Covenant, of course, some of the manna. And there was a tradition that said when the Messiah would come, he would bring that, that manna with him to feed his people. The Messiah would bring the manna to feed his people. Now, as we look at this situation here and turn to Matthew 16, when Jesus asked the question of his followers, who do men say that I am? He got a threefold answer. First of all, some say John the Baptist, and we know that even Herod began to wonder if Jesus wasn't John the Baptist after he was beheaded, coming back to life after him. Some people thought he was Elijah, you know, because Elijah was taken away and, and you know, he, he never died. So maybe the Messiah was Elijah coming back. Of course, John the Baptist and Jesus both said that's not the case. The third choice, they said, still others, Jeremiah. Why would they think? that the Messiah, that Jesus was Jeremiah because they expected him to come back with the manna. And so when Jesus breaks the bread here and gives it to them, it gives them to eat, they're there. This is the Messiah, the new Jeremiah that is coming back. When we go back to John chapter 6 later on, in the chapter, Jesus is discussing his identity with the religious leaders. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Jesus then declared, I am the bread of life. So here in Revelation 2, 17, what Christ is promising to them is himself. You'll have me. You need me. He said, you don't need to bow down and worship government, leaders, dictators, emperors as God's who provide what you need. He says you don't need to trust medicine or drinking to take care of every discomfort in your life. He says you need to keep looking to Christ as the great provider and the great physician. One more thought about this hidden manna is the contrast that it provides with that confrontation that Jesus made in his evaluation. In both Balaam's day and in John's day with the Nicolaitans, they had these feasts with meat sacrificed to idols. Idol worship involved these burnt offerings and they would have these big feasts and it would involve all sorts of morality, immorality with them. Christ's challenge seems to be this. Don't give in to that. Be willing to wait. Choose the manna over the meat. Remember back in the wilderness wanderings, God did provide this manna where daily God's people would receive this. And what did the people do? They complained that they wanted meat. God got upset. What he provided wasn't good enough. They wanted meat. They were used to the meat offered to idols and wanted that rather than what God provided. The second promise here is of a white stone. Now, white stones at that time were used for various purposes. First of all, they'd be used in a jury trial where people would have white stones or black stone. Black means guilty, white means innocent. Innocent. 
A second way that they were used is they would be used as invitations. You know, they didn't have paper invitations you could quickly run off. You know, they had stones that they gave either as an entrance into some sort of special celebration or festival or something like that. They were like a special fancy ticket. They especially were used for those involved in the Olympics. They had a special stone that would be etched in and say, you, because you have won an Olympic event, are entitled to this very special banquet of honor. And this is your entrance into that special banquet. They were also used for safety charms, much like people used to use rabbit's foot. They would take these stones and cults especially would put these secret inscriptions on them and they would uh, use them to ward off evil spirits. And then finally in the Old Testament, the Jewish high priests with the Urim and the Thummim, there were inscriptions on those and many considered that those too had been placed into the ark and taken with Jeremiah. So when he came back with the manna, he would also come back with the stones. The Urim and the Thummim. So we can see a lot of pictures here that could have been used that, you know, Jesus and John had in mind when they used those, but probably the, the most fitting one is that admission ticket. Admission ticket to this special celebration banquet for the victors, the overcomers. It was Christ's way of saying, don't settle for these fees of idol worship. He said, instead, hold on to, hold out for the special feast of my victors. Those who continue to love and trust and obey Christ. So we wrap up today, the question we began with is, what is it that we value? And how can we know and how can other people tell from our lives what we value? If you will, what we are fanatical about. Well, we can tell what we value by who or what we worship and serve. With that in mind, just a few questions. Who do we sing and talk about? Who do we sing and talk about? When we gather here, we sing like we did earlier. And we have these, these songs of praise and worship. But what happens when we leave this place and go out into a world that is not that different than Pergamum? Who do we talk about? What are we meditating about? That will show us who and what we really value. What is most important? Second question, who or what do we trust in? Who do we trust in for our safety, for our health, for our happiness, for our purpose and living? Government, medicine, those have places in our lives. God has given those things for our good. But when we begin to trust in them more than we trust in God, when we become discontented with what God provides for us and make these gods in his place and trust in them, we're putting ourselves in a dangerous place. Thirdly, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for Christ or are we just simply waiting to be put out of our misery? To take away the pain? Even as we look for Christ's return, is it that we're waiting for him or we're waiting for there to be no more problems? Are we waiting for what he has prepared for us or are we waiting for every pleasure we've ever imagined to be fulfilled? If we are waiting for him, that will show in what we hold important. We will hold important our purity and the proclamation of the gospel. 
But if we are looking for him only to return, to give us everything we want, to take us out of our misery, then what we will end up doing is start to seek our comfort and our pleasure in this life. And we will look places other than him to provide that. Finally, what are we willing to suffer and die for? Do we realize that our faith is more than words? That, that what we value is not just what we proclaim or proclaim loudly. It is living loudly in Christ's likeness. It's realizing that many times, like those at Pergamon, we will be in the minority. We will be surrounded by those who do not understand what we value because they serve other gods than we do. So what we need to do is not just tell but show the world how great our God is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. And as we look at these various churches in the book of Revelation, we realize that these people many times were suffering and they didn't know exactly what to do as they were suffering persecution because of their faith. And as Christ evaluated each of these churches and the members within that church, he was looking to see how they were responding to the heat that they were taking. He was testing to see what they really valued. Do we value Christ? Do we value God's will? Do we value a life that is lived in purity, in devotion, in sacrifice? Do we value a life that's filled with hope and joy, realizing that someday we will be in God's presence and that the struggles of this world are nothing when compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that it will be said of us individually and as a church body that we will stand true, that we will not be led astray, and that we will not only speak boldly, but that we will live loudly and lovingly as a light in the dark world. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we go out from here, that we will not leave behind our songs of praise and worship, but carry them with us deep within. We ask that our words would reflect the person of Christ. We would ask, Heavenly Father, that no matter what comes our way, there will be nothing that shakes us because we are firmly planted on Christ in Christ alone. It's in His name that we pray. Amen.